Hello, Asheville and beyond. You're listening to WPVM LP in Asheville, North Carolina and globally at WPVMFM.org. We are interviewing Judge Robert Orr today and uh, welcome Judge Orr. We're so glad to have you. Great. It's a, a pleasure to be uh, talking with you today. To me. You you are in the news. <laughs> uh, well, there, there, there is some news being generated, I will say. Yes, that. yes indeed. Yeah. So let me tell the, uh, the listeners and the viewers a little bit about you. Uh, you earned your uh, bachelor's degree at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, back in the 60s, you served three years in the Army between 68 and 71. You returned to Chapel Hill to earn your law degree from the University of North Carolina School of Law, and you entered private practice in Asheville. You were raised in Hendersonville, so you are a local gentleman. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, so uh, in July uh, 2004, uh, you were uh, retired from the Supreme Court. You were there from 94 to 2004. So you do have some experience <laughs> in the law. Yeah, a so, lot of years, a lot of years. Yeah. yeah, so you were, so there's some controversy here. You were a delegate to the 2016 National Republican Convention as a, and a supporter of John Kasich. Uh, you said that you would not vote for the party's nominee, Donald Trump, in the general election, telling a reporter that, Trump was a danger to the country. An uproar over your comments led you to leave the convention earlier. You officially resigned from or left the Republican Party in February of 2021 and changed your registration to unaffiliated. So now that now that you've had almost a year of unaffiliated, how do you feel about that decision? Which I my guess is that was a very hard decision to make. Well, in one one respect, it was very difficult. I had spent the better part of my adult life, uh, including my years when I was uh, practicing law in Asheville, working to build and grow a Republican Party that I thought would be responsive uh, to good government and sound principles. Uh, I actually served as county chairman there in Buncombe County for two years uh, as a Republican, and obviously in we, we elect judges in North Carolina, so I ran five statewide judicial races uh, as the nominee of the Republican Party and won, won the last four of those races, including two to the Supreme Court. And so I invested a substantial amount of uh, time, energy, and emotion into building and growing the Republican Party in the state. Because when I moved to Asheville, North Carolina was a one party state and that party was the Democratic Party. And so uh, it, it, it was difficult to cut the official ties with the Republican Party. But over the course of the Trump administration, I had just become so totally disenchanted, not only with uh, Trump and his conduct, but with the failure of leadership within the Republican Party, both nationally and on the state level, uh, to repudiate the kind of conduct and the kind of uh, policies that Trump was was pushing and advocating for. And so it, it really wasn't that difficult, particularly after what we saw on January 6th and, and Trump's role in that. It, it was a pretty easy decision, and I have not regretted it one day. So, uh, you know, we have interviewed all of the uh, candidates for the district, with the exception of Jasmine Beach Farrar, a lot of them are uh, military or retired military or were military. And a lot of them, most of them say it was January 6th that pushed them over the edge to, to put their hat in the ring, do the, uh, do, make the sacrifice to their, their family, their, their selves and, and go for uh, go for office. Let me just read something that you said in on Twitter, February 17th of 2021. You put on Twitter, just made it official after 45 years as a registered Republican. I am now an unaffiliated voter. I leave the GOP having won four statewide elections. 
in North Carolina as the Republican nominee. And that did come under the time when the, the Democrats were in control of the station, or the, not the station, yeah. but the station on my mind, <laughs> of the state. So uh, that, that was a, a, an, an important uh, thing to add to it. Um, and you always also say only three others in North Carolina history have won more elections. Yeah, as, as a registered Republican. And I, I would note that when I was elected to the Court of Appeals in 1988, uh, I was the first Republican elected to a statewide judicial office since 1896, which gives you a, a sense of, of uh, the long dry spell the Republican Party had, had lived through in this state. And when uh, I, Beverly Lake Jr., and I were elected to the Supreme Court, in 94, we were, again, the first Republicans elected to the Supreme Court since 1896. So um, uh, it, it was a very different world when I started practice and when I you know, first was appointed uh, initially to the Court of Appeals by then Governor Jim Martin. Well, uh, let's move on to the reason that you are in the news. So this week... You, along with 10 other Carolina voters, challenged Representative uh, Madison Cawthorn's legal eligibility to run in the Republican Party for a House seat. The complaint filed in the North Carolina State Board of Elections charges that Cawthorn is disqualified by Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which states that no person shall be a member of the House if having previously taken an oath to support the Constitution as a member of Congress, the person then engaged in insurrection against the Constitution. And Mr. Cawthorn had only been in office three days. He had he swore himself into got sworn into office on January 3rd. And this uh, movement that he made at the insurrection, was basically his first uh, step out the gate uh, for uh, to kind of give people an idea of what he was going to be about. Yeah, and let me let me clarify one thing, uh, uh, Devin. The uh, the plaintiffs or the complainants, challengers in this case, uh, are registered voters in the 13th congressional district, which is where Cawthorn, having bolted the 11th, now 14th to the 13th, uh, that's where he filed uh, for office for 2022. I'm actually one of the North Carolina Council representing them, so I'm not actually you know, one of the, the 11 challengers uh, to it. I'm one of their lawyers, let's, let's put oh, it Oh, I right. see, so yeah. you're not, okay. That's, thank you for the clarification. Yeah. You, you have to be under, under the North Carolina challenge statute. Uh, the, the complaints, the challenges have to be from registered voters in the district that the individual is running in. So now if you move back to, and, and I'll keep referring to the 14th, because that's what it will be in the 2022 election cycle. Uh, I, I'm a registered voter in Yancey County. So uh, on the assumption that remained in the 14th district, I could be a challenger, but my, my role is uh, as part of the legal team, which includes uh Two other North Carolina licensed lawyers, and then a nonprofit organization called Free Speech for People, which is based in uh, Amherst, uh, Massachusetts, and they have really been the the lead uh, counsel in this litigation and in trying to generate attention and interest in this provision, albeit somewhat, shall we say, antiquated since it was adopted. Uh, you know, post Civil War, uh, that says if if you take the oath of office to support the Constitution of the United States, and then you participate or support or engage some way in a rebellion or insurrection against the constitutional authorities of the country, then you're disqualified from holding future office. Uh, so uh, we we have a pretty expansive legal team that's working on this. Uh, and it has generated a great deal of attention, obviously locally, but nationally too. 
Well, I understand uh, some of the background of the third of the section three of the Fourteenth Amendment, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you know a lot more than I do. So, can you give uh, an, uh, the basis, or what's what's this about? Why why did it even come in and get into the Constitution? Yeah, well, you know, of course, the Fourteenth Amendment is recognized for for a wide array of other uh, provisions in it, and Section Three historically has. Uh, you know, sort of been lost in the dustbins of history, but it was put in because what was happening once the old Confederate um, power structure w started to regain control in the Conf in what had been the Confederate state, they were sending individuals to Congress and to other elective office who had previously served and taken the oath to support the United States Constitution, and then had rebelled uh, against the country uh, and violated that oath. And so the Section 3 was put in to prohibit them from being able to hold uh, future office. Now, there is a, uh, a provision that says if two-thirds of each House of Congress votes to allow an individual to run for office or be qualified, then, then you know, they, that's a saving pr provision, I guess, for those individuals. But the idea was, um, and, and I really want to emphasize this, uh, that you violated your oath to support the Constitution. And I, I think today in the 21st century, we tend to take oaths of office as, you know, sort of a perfunctory uh, process before somebody, you uh, becomes a congressman or a senator or a judge, whatever. But, uh, you know, it's included in the Constitution of the United States in Article 6 uh, that you take this oath to support and protect and defend the Constitution of, of the country. And I think the, the founders of our country and, and, you know, for all these years, the oath has really been an important part. And so, Granted, whenever Cawthorn took the oath, he had a responsibility not to engage or support or, or help in any sort of rebellion or insurrection. And I, I do want to add, it's not just the violent attack that took place on January 6th on the Capitol. There was, as we are learning more and more each day, this concerted effort to subvert the certification of the electoral votes uh, through squeezing and trying to intimidate Vice President Pence to generating congressmen who would object to certifications of various states and hope to drag out the process to allow uh, Trump to pull something out of his hat to allow him to continue to stay in power and to stop the peaceful and orderly constitutional transfer of power to Joe Biden. And so it's not just that horrific attack on the Capitol that is part of this. It's also the, the broader insurrection and rebellion uh, to undermine the electoral process. And the ongoing, the ongoing uh, <clears throat> attempt to uh, create doubt and fear and uh, uh, and it's um, shock. It's more than shocking. Yeah, it it really is. And you know, a number of commentators and and you know, people in the know have uh, have expressed their concern that January sixth and what went on uh, in trying to subvert the electoral count and the peaceful transfer of power was, in essence, a dry run for twenty twenty four. That. You know, the great fear is uh, that if Trump runs again or if one of his minions uh, ends up as the Republican nominee and then loses the election, that we run a far greater risk of having some sort of uh, illegal, unconstitutional effort that ends up being successful in subverting that transfer of power to the actual winner of the election. And so, yeah, there's there's uh, uh, there, there's a lot at stake, not just in what has happened, but in working to prevent 
that kind of undermining of democracy in the future. Well, it's the bedrock of, of why we are a democracy. And, you know, if we are not able to have that peaceful transfer and, uh, you know, we're, we're the shining city on the hill, so to speak, for other countries who came to democracy after us. And so it's a serious probably the most serious threat to democracy that I've ever experienced. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly in my lifetime. Uh, and, and it was unimaginable. I mean, it, it's just, I mean, you know, I mean, I lived through the Nixon era. <laughs> I can say I voted for Richard Nixon twice. You know, I lived through Watergate. You know, I know, I know exactly, uh, you know, the kinds of problems that, that occurred back then, but this was, so much worse, so much more dangerous. And, and as you pointed out, the, the perpetuation and the continued perpetuation of this lie that somehow the election was stolen from Trump. I mean, uh, I, I never can remember the South Dakota senator's name, the Republican who just recently said, look, Joe Biden won the election fair and square. And of course, Trump immediately attacks him and you know, he had a few of uh, his fellow Republican senators come to his support. But unfortunately, and this, again, is one of the reasons I left the Republican Party, the, the, the party leadership has failed to stand up and say he's exactly right. And Trump is just so far off the reservation that that we should have nothing to do with it. Well, uh, M Mr. Cawthorn's response to you is that left-wing activists are trying to stop me from fighting for you, the people. I won't be stopped. Help me fight back. The woke mob won't stop me. A dozen activists who are comically misinterpreting and twisting the 14th Amendment for political gain will not distract him from that service, according to his spokesperson, Mr. Ball. Right. <laughs> well, sort of ironic, I suppose. Uh, I think there are those in the congressional district that he purportedly now represents who question exactly how much work he's actually doing for the district, as opposed to, you know, traveling around the country to various expensive <laughs> venues and, and, um, uh, putting out massive amounts of tweets uh, and, and the like. Um, and I, I think these are 11 committed voters who believe that what the Constitution says is very clear. And, uh, you know, there's not a lot of room for interpretation. It says you're disqualified. If you took that oath, and then you participated in supporting uh, or, or uh, participating in an insurrection or rebellion. And uh, th there's no strained interpretation there. And it is extraordinarily serious. Uh, we hear Mr. Cawthorn, Republicans, lots of folks say, hey, we got to support the Constitution. We have to adhere to what the Constitution says. Well, this is exactly what the Constitution says. You're disqualified. And uh, we, we feel that the, the individuals who stepped up showed a great deal of moral courage uh, to file these challenges uh, uh, are to be commended. And we, as part of the, uh, the, the legal team, will do everything we can to see that the State Board of Elections uh, properly uh, disqualifies Mr. Cawthorn. Well, he didn't actively uh, be part of the people, the barbarians at the gate of the Capitol who who barged in, uh, um, but he did promote it in advance and then proceeded to say, uh, using his first time bully pulpit on that stage in front of the, dem uh, of the insurrectionists, the future of the Republic hinges on the action of a solitary few. It's time to fight. Well, and then shortly after that, he did call in to um, um, 
what's his the, the uh, Charlie Kirk show uh, with statements that are certainly um, searchable on on YouTube. Uh, yeah, I mean the evidence is the public record is replete both before January sixth and during January sixth and after January sixth of Cawthorn's uh, support and uh, belief in the big lie and the need to not certify the votes and not have Joe Biden uh, take his rightful place as president of the United States. And he, he may not have marched to the Capitol or, or gone to the Capitol with these rioters. He was inside the Capitol, armed at least as I understand from his uh, communications. And uh, while the public record is substantial about his complicity in this, uh, as part of the election challenge statute, uh, we have the right to take his deposition, to subpoena documents. Uh, the January 6th commission, uh, as I understand it, has uh, reached out to get communications from uh, from Mr. Cawthorn that indicates that uh, his engagement and involvement was even more extensive than what's on the public record. Well, uh, I was watching that day. I was glued to the uh, video, live video streaming from it. He did call, when he spoke with Charlie Kirk, he said that uh, whenever it looked like it was failing and they weren't able to have accomplished what they were hoping to do, which was uh, uh, not have the uh, election certified, um, he told Charlie Kirk that uh, he's blaming the violence that happened on left-wing agitators sent by the Democratic machine to make uh, President Trump look bad. Um, and I was, also, I was also watching some of the local and regional uh, uh, news people. Right. And they were doing the exact same thing, that it was Antifa, that it wasn't really Republicans doing this. This, this was all mischief by the Antifa and, as Cawthorn said, Democratic machine to make President Trump look bad. So there was a certified effort there, I mean, a systemic effort there uh, to immediately try to dismiss what was happening as not their responsibility. They didn't have a thing to do with it. Right. Well, and I think the evidence uh, is uh, 180 degrees uh, contrary to those assertions. I think anybody who saw it, who anybody who's read about it, uh, you know, completely understands that that false narrative, just like the the great stolen election, is a huge false narrative, uh, is an effort to try and convince people that somehow what they saw didn't happen or what they saw wasn't really what they thought they saw, which, you know, is, is ridiculous. I mean, uh, it, it's been interesting in leading up to this particular uh, challenge litigation in, in doing reading, how many people within the, the Trump administration have acknowledged in one form or another that this was not just an insurrection, not just a violent attack on the Capitol, but really was an effort to subvert the constitutional process. Mm -hmm. In Bob Woodward and Robert Costa's book, Peril, uh, it opens in the introduction with uh, General Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, appointed by Trump in a conversation right after January 6th, with Speaker Pelosi calling it just that, a coup attempt an effort to undermine democracy. Uh, the other night on the PBS NewsHour, the Republican congressman from Michigan, uh, Congressman Meyer, you know, openly said, yes, it was a violent attack to undermine the democratic process and the, and the, the certification of the electoral votes. So you have Republicans saying it, you have prominent military leaders who were there at the time, saying it. So to somehow try and convince people that, oh, well, uh, you know, that was just some some woke protesters 
or the most ridiculous um, one I've seen is that, well, this was put together by the FBI. Well, the FBI was in the under the Trump administration. So somehow I, I, I have a hard time uh, giving that crazy theory <laughs> any credence. But I mean, you know, we laugh because it seems so absurd, but the the gravity and threat to the country was real then and only is increasing in danger uh, each day. It's um, it's who are you going to believe the live video, the thousands and thousands of live video that were shot there. Who are you going to believe what you saw in the live video versus the lies, the distractions, the prevarications that came out afterwards to try to, Oh, this wasn't a problem. This was a problem act. Right. Well, I mean, all of these individuals who have been charged with crimes, uh, I'm not aware of anybody in in pleading guilty or being found guilty, uh, anybody saying, well, I was there as uh, a liberal plant. Uh, you know, <laughs> they, were all, I mean, they were all saying, yeah, we were there to support President Trump. We felt like he had called and urged us to be there uh, and to to carry this fight to the, to the Capitol. So, uh, I mean, hopefully the vast, vast majority of Americans, including Republicans, I don't care what the polls say, they know what happened. And, uh, you know, every Republican in Congress who was there knows what happened. And, you know, the great tragedy is their failure to have enough backbone and integrity to acknowledge that and to call it what it what it was. I mean, essentially, like Congressman Meyer said the other day. Well, and it's a slippery slope if they were able to prevail. That um, what happens the next time, whenever a bunch of hooligans decide, well, we don't like the outcome of that election, let's just storm the gates and and um, try to disrupt or do our best to disrupt and intimidate and. So, you know, it's, it's, it's chaos. Yes. And, and, you know, chaos that could potentially undermine the, the very foundation of American yes. democracy. And so, yes. Yes. Uh, you know, I, we take for granted, oh, it, it could never, it could never go there. Well, no. you probably find a lot of Germans who would say in 1935 or 1936, oh, well, we could never become, you know, what the Nazi regime ultimately became. But you, you start letting people with a thought, authoritarian uh, principles and, and ambitions, and, you know, unfortunately, you, you run a real risk of an authoritarian government. Well, I've done a lot of research on the 30s uh, because radio was just getting started then. And uh, the, the, the big lie that was told back then was able to prevail because at that time uh, the, uh, the Nazis were able to control the message that went out on the radio. Um, and at that time, um, some situations are kind of similar to what we're having now. There had been a pandemic in the late uh, teens and uh, a lot of, um, Instability happened because of that. And then you had severe inflation uh, and uh, technology was just taking off or radio technology was just taking off and they were able to, at Albert Speer's uh, statement in the Nuremberg trial was that because the way Hitler controlled the message, 80 million people's minds were just uh, brainwashed into believing his big lie. Yes, it, it can happen. It has yes. happened. And we have to be vigilant in this country not to let that happen. Yes. So this, uh, so I read in an article, the suit will also augment the work of the House Select Committee investigating January 6th. The House Select Committee cannot compel Cawthorn or any member of, of the House to testify in the way that they can compel people like Stephen Bannon uh, but let me turn my page here. The committee could draw on testimony from the state eligibility proceedings 
to flesh out information that it compiles from the sources. And you did say that you can request uh, discovery. We, we can, and we also could take Mr. Cawthorn's deposition. Now, uh, uh, you know, let's be, let's be candid. We are working under an incredibly short uh, time period here because the Supreme Court, uh, well, actually it was the three judge panel uh, in the redistricting case uh, pursuant to the request of the State Board of Elections has stayed any challenge process until the redistricting uh, litigation is completed. And I mean, I certainly understand that in, in the sense that the districts could be changed. What is now the 13th could have a different composition. Uh, Mr. Chalthorne might decide he wants to go back and run in his original district. I mean, you know, you don't know. Uh, but what it means is we'll have a death, maybe a month and a half to two months to try and accomplish all of this, have a hearing and have a final resolution. And so while we certainly uh, will ask to depose Mr. Cawthorn and we certainly will, will seek uh, some discovery, I, I think that it, it, it will be challenging to get it done in a timely fashion considering the constraints we're operating under. The good news is I think there is a, uh, there's an ample supply on the public record that we already have that answers the three, uh, critical, uh, the three critical questions under the 14th Amendment, Section 3. He took the oath. There was an insurrection or rebellion. And three, he supported, participated in, in some form or fashion sufficiently to disqualify him. So, uh, you know, even, even if we don't get the kind of broad discovery and deposition that we would, we would like and, and would hope to have, uh, I still think that the evidence is there in a variety of other sources. Yeah, and going back to uh, what, how, what this says in the Constitution, it says the, uh, the Constitution does impose some limits on democratic choices by requiring, for example, that candidates for Congress and the presiden presidency be at least a certain age, be citizens of the United States. Section 3 imposed an additional eligibility requirement to protect the Constitution itself. As one senator in 1866 noted, the provision is not a, manner, ma a measure of punishment but a measure of self-defense. Yeah, um, it's, it's, I, I have to include uh, that there's one leading case on the application of Article uh, of, sec, of uh, Section Three of the Fourteenth Amendment, uh, and that's a North Carolina case from 1869, where the uh, North Carolina Supreme Court unanimously held that a sheriff down in Moore County, who had previously taken an oath while the state was in the union to support the constitution. And then he had served under the Confederate government as sheriff that he was disqualified under, under uh, the 14th amendment section three. So we've got, got uh, a case right on point here in North Carolina. And then interestingly enough, and you may or may not remember that up until the 1900s, the legislature elected the U S senators and in 1870, Zeb Vance, who generated a little news uh, uh, posthumously uh, with his monument there in uh, downtown Asheville, uh, was elected to the United States Senate. And when he went there to present his credentials, he was challenged by uh, his opponent as being disqualified under the 14th Amendment, Section 3. And he was, in fact, denied uh, his seat in the Senate uh, at that point in time. Now, later he was, there was a blanket pardon and he was able to later take, take his seat. But I mean, there are two, two situations arising out of North Carolina where uh, this provision of the Constitution has been applied and an individual has been uh, denied the opportunity to, to assume uh, an office. So there is some precedent there. There is precedent. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good precedent too. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, so, so to go, to go on a little further about the history of this, a uh, senator from West Virginia in 1866 
Senator Whiteman Willie. Looking to future peace and security of this country, I ask whether it would be just or right to allow men who have thus proven themselves faithless to be again entrusted with the political power of the state. The American people answered that question by adding Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Yes. The task before us is to honor that fundamental commitment. Yes, I mean, I, I think that is the, the heart of the, of the intent of the framers of the Constitution that included uh, Section 3 in the 14th Amendment, uh, is that, you know, the, the violation of the oath to support, defend, and maintain the Constitution of the United States, when it's violated by, by supporting an insurrection against that very Constitution, you have forfeited you are disqualified from future service. And that's what this challenge is about. It's really pretty straightforward. North Carolina's uh, statute is, is uh, again, straightforward. The interesting thing is once, once that threshold suspicion of disqualification is met, which we clearly have done, then the burden shifts to the candidate. So the burden is on Mr. Cawthorn to show to the state board of elections that he, in fact, is qualified to run for Congress. And that means that there was either no insurrection or rebellion, which is ludicrous, uh, or that somehow he really had nothing to do in supporting uh, or participating in that insurrection and rebellion. And I don't think he can meet that burden. And uh, so uh, we, we think that, that this is a, a very viable challenge and are comfortable uh, with, with the facts that we have and, and certainly hope to, to add more to that. Well, he did say that it was some sort of arcane or kind of archaic <laughs> idea out of the Constitution. So, um, well, welcome, welcome to history, Mr. Cawthorn. <laughs> yeah, it, it's an old provision, but, you know, so are many other provisions in the Constitution. Yeah, like the Second Amendment. Yeah, that's that, that, right, yeah. That's so attached to. Yeah, exactly. And, and fortunately, we have had nothing like this happen since the Civil War. And, and so the fact that it hasn't been utilized in the last 100, 150 years, uh, it seems to me it's irrelevant. Uh, you know, we have not had this uh, institutional assault on the Constitution and our democracy like we saw with what happened on January 6th. Uh, and so I, I, I think that's, you know, just simply PR verbiage that Mr. Cawthorn and his communications team have uh, have put out trying to put a, a happier spin on this. Well, thank you very much for your expertise in participating in this. It's very enlightening. I think that um, I I uh, feel like somebody needs to do something. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, we're trying do something. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk. So uh, let's move on and talk about your podcast a little bit and give people, sure. the viewers, because uh, we are streaming this live to uh, social media, YouTube and Facebook. But we'll also be broadcasting this on the air Friday evening at six and Monday evening at six. So tell the listeners about your podcast, which we, by the way, are carrying and are delighted that you were doing this. And it is so needed. The more information we have about the candidates, uh, the better. Well, and, and let me thank you and, and WPVM for for your interest in, in carrying the podcast. It, it was a little bit of a flyer. I had, I had assumed I was going to retire from the practice of law this year and I, that I would have only so much time to play golf and, you know, hike around the mountains or whatever I was doing. And so I thought the, the what was then the 11th district race was really shaping up, I think, to be one of national attention um, with all sorts of interesting people 
involved in the primaries on both both sides. I mean, you had the challengers to Cawthorn uh, who have great stories, you know, Colonel Rod Honeycutt, Wendy Navarro's, Bruce O'Connell. I mean, you know, uh, and now Chuck Edwards has jumped into it, uh, the state senator. So, and then on the Democrat side, um, you know, the, I, I think based on Twitter followers and money raising, people would say Jasmine Beach Ferrara probably was the fa- favorite or is, is the favorite, but, you know, you don't know. I mean, the other candidates, um, you know, Eric Gash, Katie Dean, uh, Bo Hess, Jay Carey, they're all, you know, aggressively campaigning. So you could have a runoff there. But I, I saw the podcast as an opportunity to give all those candidates greater attention and a greater platform to talk about the issues and what they believed in. I mean, local media, particularly the print media, has been, you know, downsized and squeezed so that uh, candidates just don't get a lot of attention. And if you don't have a lot of money, you don't have the ability to communicate very well to the public. So the idea was to, uh, one, give the candidates a a greater forum, uh, generate some interest maybe around the country, not just here in the, uh, the district and the state. I also wanted to use it, and I haven't been near as uh, successful in doing this for a variety of reasons. Just talk about Western North Carolina. Talk about you know what a special place it is. Talk about its history. Talk about uh, the the remarkable uh, geographical and environmental features. You know, from Grandfather Mountain to Mount Mitchell to the Blue Ridge Parkway to Flat Rock. I mean, there's. Just, I mean, there, it's it's a fascinating place, and so uh, part of the mission was, and I hope will be in in the coming weeks, to not just talk about the candidates and the issues, uh, but but to talk about the district they're running in and why those of us. I mean, my family settled in the Little River section of Transylvania County in the 1790s. And uh, the old original Robert Orr, who died in 1808, is buried in a little family cemetery in the Little River section. And, you know, so th- this has been, this area has been a huge part of my family and my life. And so it's an opportunity, uh, hopefully, to, to talk about how special it is, how it's changed, how, you know, what are the issues and needs of the people here. So uh, the... But I, but I will say the podcast has been more work than I thought, and it is a money losing proposition. So, uh, and, and my accountant said I can't take it off my taxes. So, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> well, but it, it's sort of a labor of love, I guess. Yeah. Well, and that's the same with community radio. Uh, these stations were established in the early two thousands to bring media back into the community, more local media into the community. And that's uh, what we hope that we're accomplishing with with our with this station. It's absolutely non-commercial and non-biased or or non-partisan. So we thank you as a formal Republican for uh, coming on. Uh, my family too settled in the 1750s around the uh, uh, Highway 11 area up uh, on the other side of the mountain range there. South so, Carolina 11 or, or down in South Carolina? Or? Down in South Carolina, yeah. yeah. Uh, around Liberty. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and so, you know, we we both come from deep roots in the area, and it's heartbreaking to see uh, things turn to, such a, turn to such a dark area. Well, it, it is, but as you know from our history, and I, I like to tell this story, um, my great grandfather was a farmer over in Henderson County uh, when the Civil War broke out, and he was unwilling to fight for the Confederacy. And so he and 80 other men ultimately went over the mountains to East Tennessee and joined the Union Army and said he would fight his way back. And so he came back a Lincoln Republican. So I, I tell folks I at least came by my Republican roots, honestly. Yes. Uh, but but, you know, the divide in this geographical area in the 11th district uh, or 14th district, whichever you want to categorize it, uh, you know, there was a huge partisan divide for many, many years 
based upon which side did you support and fight for in the Civil War. I mean, growing up in, in Henderson County, I mean, there was a Republican funeral home and there was a Democrat funeral home. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, my, one of my English teachers uh, got mad at me one day in high school and said, Bob, or you're a scalawag just like the rest of your family. And he knew which kids came from Republican families that had supported the union. Uh, because she was a big, strong Democrat, I might add. So, uh, so you know, I mean, we, we've certainly seen partisan divides. Uh, this one maybe is a little different uh, than what they experienced during and after the Civil War. Uh, but, you know, we, we can only hope for better times. Well, thank you so much for your efforts and uh, your, your uh, expertise in helping to bring this um, section of the Constitution to people's attention. And um, we hope to have you on again anytime you want to come on. Well, I, I'll look forward to it. And, and thanks again that, you know, you can go to our website for the podcast, which is www.thebattleforNC14.com. Uh, that does have, we have a lot of information. Thank you very much for scrolling that. You, you know, we have redistricting maps. We have uh, links to all of the candidates probably needs to be updated because with the filing being delayed and Cawthorn jumping districts, you know, that, that's been a, a big change. But, but we hope that it can be a, a resource for people interested in the race. Uh, and we just, again, appreciate your interest and willingness to help us carry the message. Well, uh, people on chat are accusing us to be being far leftist. And I have to say, I'm unaffiliated. I have been unaffiliated here since I moved here in 1989. And Judge Orr was a Republican. <laughs> yeah, well, only for there. five years. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I, that's why I wore the red sweater here. You know, I'm just. A, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk to you again. We're signing off. You're listening to WPVM LP in Asheville, North Carolina, 1037 on the dial and globally at WPVMFM.org.